is this has been the last four and a half years of my life. And putting this talk together made me realize that one, we've come a really long way. Um, into wow, <laughs> I can't believe it's almost over. Um, the one thing is I'm not going to be showing very much data because this is going to be reported for YouTube. Um, it's going on our Ignite YouTube channel, and because we haven't published. Uh, any of the data yet. Um, I'm not going to show uh, any specific data, but we're going to talk about some important things that we were finding in the trial. Um, but so the first thing is, what what is the Ignite Network? <clears throat> this is the Implementing Genetics and Clinical Practice Network. It's funded by NHGRI. The purpose of this was to go in hand in hand with some of the other networks that they have in place. So they have one around clinical sequencing. They have one around electronic medical records and genomics. They have one around children, which is insight. And this one was supposed to be around how do you get technology or genomic medicine into clinical practices. And what they wanted people to do was come with a project that was genomic medicine, that had been shown to be effective, and have some community partners that you're going to implement this intervention in to see what happens when you try to do this and how can we work together. So there were six projects that were funded. How do we all get together? hear stories about how this is working and not working, and come up with some best practices for trying to do this in, um, in healthcare outside of the um, research grant environment. So there are six projects that are listed here. So Duke, Mount Sinai, University of Florida, um, the uh, Vanderbilt University, University of Maryland, and Indiana University. Three of those are pharmacogenetics projects, and then um, ours is family history. Mount Sinai was a um, disease diagnosis, I mean, a um, risk assessment using apoe one for hypertension, and then Fairwood study was a disease diagnosis around um, the Modi gene. Um, so our project was implementation, adoption, and utility of family health history and diverse settings. And Jeff and I are um, co-PIs on that project. So taking a step back, this is where we were in 2012 when we were getting ready to write this grant, okay? So we had um, information about um, the value of systematic risk assessment, which was being driven by family health history, okay? So there's clinical value to it, and, and there was research value to it, and very little was being done in this space, a little bit, but not a lot. Uh, so we thought, okay, if we take what's coded in the guidelines when they say, if you have a patient has a family history that looks like this, and that means that there is increased risk for whatever it is, hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome, and they should get a genetic test. How do we help providers do that? Because it's not happening in clinical care right now. And there are multiple reasons why that, that wasn't happening. And then there was the research side, which was all the guidelines were being driven by very selective patient populations. So for example, the HBOC guidelines around what a family history looks like that should trigger a recommendation for genetic counseling was all done for patients who had breast cancer. Well, there are lots of people. Just ignore it. Okay. There's lots of people who who don't have breast cancer but have terrible family histories, or there are people who have breast cancer who don't have terrible family histories. And so we need to actually take unselected patient populations and look at what are the family histories that are occurring out there in our world, and better understand what implications those things have from a more unbiased um, perspective. And so there's a whole lot of other things that we could do with this information. We could link it to genetic. Um, uh, known genetic markers. We can look for unknown genetic markers that family history might help us discover. Um, we can look at all kinds of things. So uh, we were very interested in this idea. And one of the clinical value examples is this idea of, of um, the risk stratification for, for um, breast MRI. So for breast cancer, if you have a 20% lifetime risk of breast cancer, you're supposed to get a breast MRI for your breast cancer screening. And the breast MRI is supposed to happen in conjunction with a mammogram, and you're supposed to start at age 35. Well, if you didn't start your mammograms on your female patient until she was 50, like the routine the guidelines suggest, you're very likely to have missed something bad happening to her in, at an earlier age. So, so this is the kind of thing that we were trying to get more integrated into clinical practice. Um, and then on the research perspective, there's this idea of POP2. So we all know about BRCA. Um, one and two, they have very high penetrance. There's a very strong risk for breast cancer and ovarian cancer with their mutations, as well as some other cancers. But it didn't explain very much of the breast cancer that was occurring in people with bad family histories. And so 
after a number of years, they actually found this mutation who had, who had a little bit lower penetrance than PRCA1 and 2, which are around 80%. Well, for the first time, they looked at how does that penetrance change depending on a patient's family history. So in this case, they found that if you have no first-degree relative with family history, uh, early family history breast cancer, then your risk of get, getting breast cancer yourself is 33% over your lifetime. If you have uh, two or more first-degree relatives with breast cancer, that's 58%. That's a huge difference in their risk, and that may it's significant enough that it may you know, drive different decision-making on the patient's part in terms of what they want to do to prevent their breast cancer. So better understanding those things is uh, one of the reasons that we embarked on this project. <clears throat> so the problem, um, we should be doing risk assessment. Family health history is the strongest predictor of risk assessment, um, but we're, we're not doing it. If you ask providers, they say, I'm not going to do much. Okay, don't collect history on my um, And the reasons are multiple, right? They're across multiple stakeholders. Patients don't really know their family history very well. If you were to ask yourself right now, you're sitting down with your doctor, you know, what does grandma have and how old was she? Most people don't know the answer to that question. Um, so, so their awareness of their family history and the accuracy of family history reading from the patients was limited. Providers really didn't understand what they were supposed to do with it. It's time consuming to collect. And um, the health system didn't even have uh, infrastructure in place for you to really collect it um, in an appropriate way. And everybody believes, um, as we've been told, hereditary cancers are rare. If you don't ask this information, you're not missing a lot of people. And our question was, is that true? So <clears throat> our goal was to take this traditional flow of family health history information, which was patients sitting down in the doctor's office, not knowing what to say, and then them having <clears throat> a discussion about what to do to, to this model, where a patient's at home, they have a web um, portal where they can enter information, they can log in and out and talk to their relatives and gather more information. And when they're all done entering that information, it gets synthesized and sent to the medical records uh, and to the physician in the process. And then when the patient goes in and meets with their doctor, they actually have a shared decision-making visit where they talk about, well, based on the information that you entered, here's your risk, here's some things that we could do about it, you know, here's the pros and cons, what should we do? So that was our goal. Uh, so we had this um, tool built, um, it's called MeTree. It's a patient-facing risk assessment clinical decision support program, and so it essentially does what I just described. It educates the patients, they can update it. It was provided real-time clinical decision support for both the patient and for the provider. The providers no longer had to collect data. It would create a pedigree, run all these risk calculators, and give them clinical decision support that was tied to evidence-based guidelines. <laughs> So that was 2012, right? And we built this software program, and it had been um, built so that it was installed on a local computer. So it wasn't this web service that we had in our minds for this model, but um, it was installed on a software program. A software program was installed on a local computer. It collected data on 44 conditions, provided clinical decisions four for five, and then we created um, reports where the patient would get one that sort of said, talk to your doctor about X, and the provider's report would say, you should do Y. Um, very clear, action-oriented um, reports, which we had worked with the providers to make them the way that they wanted them. And this is what it looked like. I mean, when I went back and pulled out these pictures, I thought, oh my God, we really have come a long way. It's a nice little radial buttons, you know, it took 25 minutes to put five relatives in here. You know, it was, this was not um, state of the art, but uh, this was what we had built and we piloted in um, Cone Health System. So we had three clinical practices, one where there was an inter, um, one that was a control, and two that were intervention clinics. And we basically invited participants to, um, were coming to see their doctor in the next couple of weeks to come in an hour before their appointment and complete knee treat. <clears throat> And then uh, we looked at the results of that, and that information was available when we were getting ready to write uh, the grant. But some of the key things that we learned from this were, one, we got significantly more data and better quality data when we use this tool compared to when you were using the normal clinical practice standard of care. So this graph uh, basically shows, I'll put me over here, but um, <clears throat> If you have, this is the percent of relatives that meet high quality criteria. High quality criteria means that you enter five different pieces of information about them, who they 
they are, how they're related to you, whether they're male or female, what their medical problems are, age of onset of the medical problems, if they're alive or dead, and if they're dead, why and, when, and what age. All right, so you all have those five characteristics for a relative to be considered high quality. So at the beginning, if you don't require anybody to have high quality criteria, there's 100% of, the, um, of the reports have that. If you require 20% of the relatives to have high quality, then we get about 80 plus um, of people that meet that criteria. Actually, somewhere around 35% um, of the pedigrees had, um, that had relatives with high quality information in them at 80%. And then you can see kind of tail tips down there. But when we looked at the, the about, it was kind of a nice curve, actually. I, I like it. So 50% of the pedigrees had 50% uh, of the relatives with um, high quality data, okay? Which is pretty remarkable because when you look at the charts, when you look at the um, existing data that was written in the medical charts on these patients, only 4% of them had one relative with five, five of those criteria. One relative. So you're talking about, you know, you're, so to get 50% of the relatives with high quality data on 50% of your patients is pretty impressive. Um, the other thing was that we looked at the, at the impact of the education, we a lot of education, and we were recruiting patients to talk to their relatives, um, which they did. So about 66% um, of them went and talked to their relatives, and they talked to, on average, to 2.2 relatives. Uh, but we wanted to see exactly what the impact of the education was. And so at one point, we decided to take 100 people and have them just, when they enrolled in the study, they just sat down and completed the tool at the point of care, just like they would in a physician's office. Then we gave them the educational material and told them, all right, come back in two weeks at your doctor's appointment an hour before, just like you're supposed to, and you can update anything in the tool that you want. Or not, whatever you decide to do, but here's the educational material. And so what you see on this chart is that 49% actually went out and they went out and talked to people and they came back and they made changes. But the changes are really interesting. So there were, um, hard to read on there, but so the total number of changes was 412 changes, right? And the average of, of 8.4 per person. So when I came back, I made, a, on average, I made 8.4 changes in whatever data I had entered in the tool. But there were things like adding and removing a relative. <laughs> removing a relative, okay? So I went home and I found out Aunt Betsy isn't really my aunt, she's my mom's best friend, right? <laughs> or maybe they told him that he's not really got it. <laughs> um, change relative age, that makes sense. Change relative alive death status. Really? No. Didn't know that they were alive or dead, <laughs> okay? But that, I mean, that was 208, all right? Percent change, um, percent change cause of death makes sense to me. Change um, relative to makes sense. Um, so those are things that we know that people don't really know very well, but even that they don't know their family structure is pretty impressive um, finding on here. So here's the other thing um, that we found. Are providers missing people if they don't ask for family history? 44%. So we had 1,184 people take this tool at home. 4% of them had something that they were increased risk for. And 25% or an increased risk for hereditary cancer syndrome. That's huge. I mean, we've been telling people that the prevalence of HBOC is 0.025%, that Lynch syndrome is 0.1%, and these are the highest prevalent hereditary syndrome. But if you apply NCCN's guidelines for what a family history looks like, for which you should be getting genetic counseling, is 26% of the general population. There are not enough genetic counselors in the world to do that. Right, that's pretty, pretty, it was very striking and we were not expecting that. Uh, breast MRI, about almost 1% um, met those, chemoprophylaxis for breast cancer, 5%, and so on, so you can see. But it was, it, they were higher than we were expecting. So this is the, um, the last piece, and this is the most important. If we tell the providers and the patients that the patients at increased risk and they should be doing something, what happens? Does that something happen? And so the answer is yes, but we saw something we weren't looking for. So um, here, before, you, before patients were using these traits, and they rolled in the study, we went back and looked backwards. Um, there were 93 patients who were, meet, or were getting some type of high-risk service. They were getting an early colonoscopy, they were getting a breast MRI, whatever it was. 93 of the 1,184. But 
but the vast majority of those, so 88% of them, actually weren't found to be an increased risk when they took me tree. Now, there are other reasons to get those things, but that's kind of a lie. Uh, so just hold on to that thought. All right, there were 230 patients who were found to be at increased risk, all right, and only 12 of them were getting what they were supposed to be getting. So only 6%, there's a lot of people that were not getting what they should be getting. All right, so then, all right, they did mention me tree. tree said, you know what, you should be doing this, or you shouldn't be doing this. And um, the, uh, 29, they changed their pairs of the providers put in order for that breast MRI, and the patient went and got that breast MRI. So there's fear change. Um, so that 79% were now getting the care that they needed. <clears throat> what was interesting was that of those 82 who weren't at increased risk who were getting services, only 11 continued to get those services afterwards. So Mitri in some way was able to reassure people that they, didn't, they weren't really at increased risk and didn't really need that service, and um, they were able to stop that. Um, not something we were looking for, but it was quite so all of that is led to us saying we, we should apply for this night grant. We have we have good data. So pilot is a single site, it's just green for North Carolina. I mean, they could be really different than the rest of the world. So you know, we should do this. Do this big. So, um Jeff looks much better in that picture than I do. I don't, I don't really know why that is, but um, <laughs> <laughs> this is a study that we, we, we went to Ignite with, and we said, we're going to take this new tree, and we're going to implement it in across five different healthcare systems. Um, let me just skip to that. So we have a bunch of, of TIs. Yeah, this is a big study. Um, we're going to um, put it in five different healthcare systems, and we're going to see if we integrate it into these primary care practices, what happens. Do so we see the same thing that we saw in COVID? Are there a lot of people that are being missed? And if we tell the doctors that they're being missed, will they start doing things to help those patients? So um, our proposal had four aims. Um, they have um, nice little nicknames, like specific aim one was optimize each tree, and specific aim two was IT, and specific aim three was a big trial, and specific aim four was our world domination aim. We were going to spread the word, <laughs> okay? Um, so specific aim one. Anybody here know who this is? All right, so I'm not the only, <laughs> the only one that I love. <laughs> the six million dollar man. And particularly, we can rebuild him. We have the technology. We can make him bigger, better, and stronger, faster, right? And that's what we wanted to do with Matri. We wanted to make it bigger, better, stronger, and faster, but we did it for less than six million dollars. Um, and what we did was we made it a web service. So we took it off that local computer, we set it up on a um, web enabled computer and allowed people to access it from outside. We created a Spanish version. We expanded the conditions and the clinical decision support. We created this graphic user interface, which is beautiful, after the radio button one. Um, and we added all these data standards to it. We added American Health Information Community standards for high quality family health history, which means things like adding adopted status and continuity and other things that added in the first version of the tool. We created interactive reports. And then we included support for HL7, Synamed, and ICD-9. And this becomes a huge thing later. And I will tell you the story. And I would love to take credit for this, but it wasn't me. It was the Surgeon General. <laughs> it, was, it was Richard Carmona who put out this Surgeon General Initiative for Family Health History in 2004. And as part of that, they built the Surgeon General Family History Tool called My Family Health Portrait. Now, My Family Health Portrait is practically unusable. I mean, no one who has ever tried to use it has been able to do it. It's very hard, but it was state-based, it was open source, and it was the first time that a tool had been set up like this on the web for people to use to get them engaged in family history. And so we, we took that as sort of the structure that we were going to use when we created our graphical user interface, and they based theirs on these data standards. So we said, well, if they're going to do data standards, we're going to do data standards. And um, it was a very good decision. So this is what the report, I mean, this is a little bit about the tool looks like, so the, the new interface, um, collect a lot of information about the patient. We have this nice little API to the Medline Plus Connect where they hover over a condition, it will pull up in a fifth grade reading level everything that's in um, the National Library of Medicine's Medline. Um, and so it's, it's very nice for a context sensitive health. Um, and then we have these interactive reports. Uh, that you 
can click into, there's a lot of references and resources and things. You can click on those and they'll take you to sites. And so we were really trying to get the patients more um, engaged in the kinds of uh, discussions they needed to have with their providers. And then the providers, the same thing, we would take them to guidelines and stuff like that in, in their reports. The specific aim to this is our, our IT aim. So we had a collaboration with Intermountain when we started the grant, and they were going to do uh, these three things. They were going to build a standard data database. They were going to try to integrate with the problem list. This is all going to be custom. Nobody had done anything like this before. And um, something terrible happened. Intermountain switched from their homegrown CMR system to Sperna right when we got funded. And nothing could get done. They were so engaged in their Cerner transition that nobody in IT could do anything. So for a year and a half, nothing happened on A2. And every time, you know, we talked to them, we're like, well, what can we do? You know, and we would brainstorm it, and not, that nothing could be done. And we didn't see an end to that. Um, and I felt really, really bad for them. Uh, we're still very close with them. They're, they're great people, but they just, it was bad timing. So um, something really interesting happened around that time, and that is this new standard called Smart on Fire was becoming um, sort of becoming more adopted um, and was being discussed in the data standards group and was gaining a lot of traction. And, and at the same time, we had somebody at Duke who had come here who was a physician but was also um, a coder. And, started to take over the direction that he wanted to go with data standards and um, mobile health. And, um, and so with his expertise, we decided that Duke was going to take on this, this aim, and we were going to do SmartFire. So what SmartFire is, is it is a data standard and a, um, uh, I'll show you, but it's the thing that allows you to do a couple of different things including authentication and stuff like that. So it's got a process to it, and then it's got a data standard there. So it allows interoperable uh, data exchange between a web service to something that sits outside as a third party with another program that's more enabled, which now are our EMRs. All right, so Epic's part is enabled. So you can take an app that lives outside this Epic, and it can interact directly with Epic. And that is what um, was so transformative as a vision but um, nobody had been able to do anything like this before. And so and I, throughout this, I have my lessons. So I titled this Lessons Learned. So this was a lesson that if you get your eyes open, sometimes things will happen for the better. Um, so, so the key features of Smart Fire are that it's based on standards, all right? And so when I told you that HL7, ICD-9, SNOMED codes that we built Metreon, that allowed us to be able to take advantage of this. So um, it was very fortuitous that that happened. They, um, the Smart Power of combined authentication and data transmission as a single plug and play app. And that's the first time they did. Data standards had always been separated from the whole authentication process. It's the first time it's just all together, you just do it. Um, it was open source, and um, they were trying to keep out all of the um, extra stuff. So if it, in um, ICD 9, if we don't have something, uh, a condition that fits exactly with the code, but there's this one that's not otherwise specified, right? So this is about all that other stuff falling outside the coding. They try to keep that out um, so that we can more readily communicate what we need to communicate. But most importantly, the vendors started saying they were going to do this. <clears throat> so Epic and Cerner came out and said, you know what, we're going to support this. We've decided we're not going to try to build everything ourselves. And we're going to allow a third party app to interact with our, our records. And they had never said that before. Right? It was a huge shift in their perspective on the EMR. So what SMART does is a, it stands for substitutable medical apps for usable technology. It in, integrates um, things that are used often in like Google and Facebook. And every time you sign in to something else with face, your Facebook account, that's OAuth. Okay? And this incorporates OAuth. Um, as one of its processes. It also allows you to do an HTML5 JavaScript. So wherever you are, when you see, like, if you go to a web page and you see a Google map embedded in it, that's that HTML5 JavaScript. And it permits that kind of display of data from another source within your window, right? And then it allows this thing called micro-interactions, which allows you to create multiple views of that data. So I'm going to show you some examples. 
And then Fire basically is the data standard. So it allows you to push and pull the data and that everybody is going to understand what that data is. So the way we envisioned this was that there was going to be a patient flow and a provider flow for the smart fire. And the main thing for the patient was that you go into my chart, you click the link, and you're single sign-on authenticated into me tree, right? And then the fire APIs automatically pull all the data that resides in your medical record that we need to run your risk scores into me tree for it. And then when they get into me tree, all they have to do is populate the extra stuff, stuff that's not in your medical record. You no longer have to go out and collect your LDL and your ACL and interim in Right? And then the rest of it is happens already normal, so they get their reports and so on. And eventually, you can actually push data back into the EMR through the Fire APIs, but Epic will not allow that right now. They totally freaked out by the idea of somebody putting data into their into their records, so um, that's not enabled. All Turner does allow that. And then the provider workflow is that I'm in the EMR, I'm in a patient's chart, I click the link, and inside the EMR window, I now get to see all of the output related to that risk report. I can see the data and I can interact with it in a graphical way in multiple views, right? Much more, um, uh, you're, a lot more, you're able to interact with it at the level you want to instead of just having to have a static report. So if you want to see more, more data, you can see more data. If you just want to know what to do, you can look at just what, what you need to do. So I'm going to let you know, three. This was the big one. This was the trial. Right? And so we had five national healthcare partners. They were very different. Our goal was to make sure that we had entirely different types of systems and entirely different types of patient populations. Right? So we had David Grant Medical Air Force Base. We had the University of North Texas, which has a large Hispanic population. We had Duke. Um, we had uh, Essential Rural Healthcare Institute. Uh, we went into Casey and I went to <laughs> Dealey, Minnesota in November, worst time of the year. <laughs> Um, there was one restaurant open, and when I asked them if they had any vegetarian food, they said, what? <laughs> so not, not a good time to go to Julie. But anyway, um, we also went to we, and, yes, and, we went, and we went to Medical College in Wisconsin. Um, and so Medical College in Wisconsin was sort of this urban inner city population. Um, and they all had very different patient populations. So we, we thought this was a good mix, and um, so we were, we were going to do this hybrid type 3 implementation effectiveness trial. So does anybody here know what? That is, that's you, and only because I taught you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, implementation trials look at how you, um, what's the culture of the health system? What are their incentives for doing whatever it is you want them to do? What are the characteristics of the intervention that fit with them? What are the ones that don't? What's their, the feasibility of them actually being able to roll this out? Um, do the providers actually believe this is a worthwhile intervention? All of these things sort of about the environment, the external environment around the politics and the state, around the health system itself, around the clinic structure and the providers, um, forms the basis of, of assessing how, um, what are the features of a health system that will allow this to work or not work. Yeah, that's kind of what implementation is. Effectiveness, you guys know what effectiveness is. It's, you know, assessing whether I'm saving lives or improving quality of life or um, changing clinical care with my, my intervention. So type 3 means that there was already very well-validated effectiveness data that existed for the intervention. This was largely an implementation trial, but by the way, we are going to collect effectiveness data too. Okay? And so what that looked like was, um, with three straight, there are three stages to the implementation. So the pre implementation where you go out and you gather all this information about the climate of the system, you develop an implementation process for that setting, and then you implement it, and then you gather your data. Okay, so the three steps to that. Um, and we based it on the idea that if you use organizational um, readiness for change, uh, which is a bunch of different constructs, and you use that to inform how you develop your implementation, that you'll get, that you'll get a better outcome. More, there'll be greater uptake of that implementation. You'll be able to sustain it, and you'll have better um, effectiveness down the road. So that's the idea of this model, which is what we based our, um, our, our trial on. So these are implementation outcomes. There's something called the RE-AIM. RE-AIM stands for REACH Effectiveness uh, Model Adoption, Implementation, Integrity, and Exposure, and, and Maintenance. So the kinds of things that you're measuring for implementation outcomes are 
All right. Of the people who are doing this intervention, how closely do they represent the general population at that site? Are they very selected kinds of people, or are they really very broadly um, reaching uh, the patient population? For model adoption, it's of the providers who decide that they want to do this, what do they look like? Is it everybody? Is it only a handful? If it's only a handful, how are they different from the others? Um, implementation integrity is if they implement it the way that you said that they should. Like if our intervention was, was X, did they have to adopt it to do something different? Do they take pieces of it out because they couldn't do it in their health system? Uh, and then maintenance and sustainability are things like cost effectiveness, they don't things like that. So those are the primary um, implementation aims, uh, outcomes, and then these are the uh, effectiveness outcomes that we were going for. The main two are the percent uptake of Mitri by the patient, um, Mitri recommendation by the patient and the provider, okay? Uh, those were our primary outcomes, but this is a mix of data that comes from data entered into Mitri, data completed, uh, survey data completed by the patient, survey data completed by the providers, um, and EMR data. So it was a whole gamish of data that we were going to be collecting to get at these things. So in the pre-implementation stage, we built education, we did, um, we, we videoed um, the tool and some instructions on how to use it, we built a website, we, we did all kinds of things to, to develop some educational materials around it. We engaged site PIs at each place who would go out and champion it. We went for site visits and we talked to the clinics and the providers and all of the staff and got them engaged in it. And then we had them um, take this work survey which looks at implementation culture um, at the setting. So we had a bunch of different people take, take that so we could better understand their culture and then we also did qualitative interviews. And we used all of that information from each site to develop the implementation plan. Um, and so once we developed an uh, implementation plan, we would get feedback from the site and then we went ahead to optimize it and, and rolled it out. Everybody agreed to do this electronic protocol because it was, was going to make everybody's life easier, um, we thought. And um, the way this worked was there were clinics that enrolled. So this was a cluster randomized trial. So we had clinics that were enrolled and there were clinics that were not. And we asked the providers within those clinics if they wanted to be part of the trial or not. So we had specific providers who were enrolled. And then we invited every patient who had an upcoming appointment with one of those providers to complete the entry. And we did it all electronically. So we sent them an email and there was a link and then they did an online consent and they clicked the link and then they did an online survey and they clicked the link and then they finally got the entry. Okay. <laughs> so that didn't go as well as we should have. <laughs> but it was worth a shot. Um, but, uh, so then once they completed Mitri, there was a report generated for the patient right then, but for the provider that the site, different sites had different ways of getting that information to the provider. And two, what we did is it was automatically scanned into all days using the patient's MRN, and it showed up in the clinical notes of the Mitri risk assessment report. In other places, they had to do a more manual process. And then we looked at, um, Surveying the providers at six months out, we surveyed the patients at baseline at three months out and at 12 months. And then we also pulled all the data from the EMR to see if Mitri made a recommendation. Was there an order put in the computer based on that record that was related to that recommendation? And then did it, did it actually happen? Did the patient actually go and do whatever it was? All right. This is what that looked like. <laughs> this is very messy. <laughs> um, but so that's how we put all these two IT pieces together. Um, there were multiple different IT systems that we had to integrate together. There we had to do one for the provider, there was a different one for the coordinators and a site coordinators versus the central coordinator. And it was, it was, I learned a lot. <laughs> I am, I am going to get an informatics degree now. <laughs> um, so data, data was complex, right? So it was multi-source. So for example, this is the kinds of data that we were getting um, in Mitri, right? Data, data variables. These are the kinds of data that we were getting when we were creating accounts for Mitri, like who's the patient, where do they live, what's their email address, um, if they declined, why did they decline, where are they coming from, how did they access Mitri, did they use a smartphone, did they use a tablet, were they doing it at home, or did they go to the study coordinator and say, I need help, um, what was their education level, insurance, and so on, so we're tracking a lot of stuff in this system, and then 
within METRI, we generated all these risk scores and then recommendations for their risk level. And this is data on, um, this is an example of the EMR kind of data that we were pulling. Um, and then these were some of the surveys that we were giving. It's just, there's so much data, it's unbelievable. Um, but these are the main categories. So um, we had to take all this disparate data. <laughs> Rachel had to take all this disparate data and merge it together. Right? And so we've been working on that. So, so we, we finished enrolling in March of this year. And we've been working on gathering all of this remaining data. The EMR data was meant to be done a one-time poll at the very end of the study. Um, and we're still waiting um, on some of that data from one of our sites. But, so we enrolled five health systems, and we had to kick out medical co the, the Air Force Base. Because <laughs> um, unfortunately, when people leave every single year, you can't get anything done. So the PI changed four times in three years. The, the person that was there that was actually supposed to be you know, implementing the trial, they're, they're supposed to be there for longer periods of time, and we went through three. And then um, the patients were leaving, and the providers were leaving, and nobody nobody knew about the trial. Within a year, everybody had to be replaced and started off, and we had to start from scratch. We just finally gave up. Um, but uh, so we went with four health systems. We got 19 clinics enrolled, 100 providers, and 2,514 patients. Um, so let's move on. The military is a challenging population. However, the military would have been fabulous if it was a younger population. And what we saw in our studies is that, you know, in general, in research trials and in what you see in clinic, it's largely women and it's largely older people. Um, and we would really like to do risk assessments on people who are younger. So we want to think about, like, how do we engage that population? Um, it's it's going to be different than just getting primary care providers on board. Um, so we thought about, you know, gamification, or maybe it's cascade screening. So if I identify an older person with a condition and then I spread out to their family members, um, that may be a better way to engage these people, because most of them aren't in clinics, they're not going to doctors. Um, also, um, there may be a better way of <laughs> implementing this than the way we did it, which was through the primary care providers. It's possible that this would be better done as sort of a broad um, population based screening um, instead of trying to say, okay, you're a senior doctor, we're going to recruit you. Um, but rather identifying a whole bunch of people and then saying, okay, you people are really at high risk. We need to get you into the doctor kind of approach. So there might be a better way to approach this for sustainability. In the study progression, we saw um, differences in, um, in, in education level um, as they went through. So we actually did pretty well with our retention despite that very complicated process. Once we got them in, so we had 10% uptake of all the people we invited. 10% of people enrolled. And we had very little drop off between, well, we actually had a good amount of drop off between the call us and said they were interested and then actually signed the consent. But once they signed the consent, they pretty much did the survey. Like 95% of people signed the consent, did the survey. And then um, of the people that did the survey, most started, almost everybody started MeTree. But then within MeTree, we had on average an 80% completion rate. But we saw that that varied depending on your education level. So if you were in graduate school, it was a higher rate than if you had high school or less. And so we're, we're thinking about ways to address that um, particular issue, although it wasn't specifically significant. Um, also, what we were really interested in is we had these very different populations. And so the key was that these things happen differently at different settings and with different patients. And what we found was that there really wasn't any difference based on the site that they were at, the clinic they were at, or whoever, who their provider was. It was really was largely driven by demographics. All right, risk assessment. Um, we saw something very similar to what I showed you for the pilot study. There is a lot of people who meet risk criteria for, for getting genetic testing or counseling for hereditary syndrome. We had more hereditary syndromes now. We included outside of cancer. We added cardiac um, hereditary syndrome, and we had liver hereditary syndrome. And those, you know, contributed a smaller amount, but there's still a very high number of people meeting criteria for cancer, um, hereditary genetic counseling. Um, and so, well, we're going to need to figure out what we're going to do about that. Um, and then I told you about the education thing. And then um, the EMR data. So we're still waiting. Um, one site has not yet given us all their EMR data. So um, we're 
we're, we're not able to, to analyze that yet. But uh, one of the things that we found is we thought we're going to we built this template and we said we're all on Epic. This is going to be easy. And it's I mean literally it's been nine months and one of the sites who's on Epic still hasn't been able to get us the data. And it's not because they're not trying. It's just every site at Epic is so different. So there needs to be another way to try to, to, to manage this data on multi-site studies. And I think one of the ways that I've been thinking about is, well, if I can pull higher data on every one of those patients in the industry, why can't I pull the rest of the data I need for my outcomes? And I think you can, because there are, there are different APIs that look at different aspects. There are APIs for who the provider is. There are APIs for cost now in FHIR. There are APIs for data, um, the individual data. So the only thing that I think that they don't have is labs. Although they may, I'll have to double check. But so thinking more broadly about ways that this kind of data can be accessed um, outside of the way that we traditionally do it. That's good. Yes, I had a small familial hypercholesterol and a cascade screen supplement from the network. And the goal was if you get some people who meet um, familial hypercholesterol and you know, a risk to get them screened, if they actually screen positive and we give them a your family letter, will they give that to their relatives and their relatives get screened? It's not cascade screening, it's not something that's done very often in the US. Um, it's done in Europe quite a bit. But um, it's still not clear what the best way is to do this, so we were testing this process. So we now have um, some um, kits, and people consented, but we haven't actually run the, um, the kits yet, so we don't know how many of those people are going to turn out to be positive. So we actually haven't started the test age for you for soon. So um, in summary, Nature is the first ever smart fire app that was integrated in EMR, so we've got patient and provider interfaces. We were able to recruit diverse patients from diverse settings, but it was challenging. Um, we are able to reproduce the high impact of actually doing systematic risk assessment based on family history in the general population, and we need to consider what that um, kind of demand would have on those risk-based services. And then I think newer technologies can be used to leverage and facilitate the barriers to access to what's like the younger population for the data outcomes. So that is it. Thank you all for listening. I'm happy to take a part. Yeah, they're 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 merging with Cerner, and Cerner supports Smart Fire. Um, they're actually further along in their Smart Fire than um, Epic is. They actually have a very interesting. It's a cloud-based process. So basically, um, at Epic, every site has to turn it on themselves. Whereas with Cerner, because it's all cloud-based, everybody's using the same APIs. If you say you want it, you just flip the switch, and it automatically works. Which is which is really maybe it's truly plug and play. Whether the VA would be willing to do something like that is another question. Because you know the VA is very freaky about their data. And I'm not sure that they'd be willing to let it um, go into a third party app no matter how secure. So we actually have a study of Mitri at the VA right now. And it was a four year contracting process to get them to agree to let us keep the tool on our servers behind our firewall. And as it is, the patients aren't allowed to enter any PHI, and if they do, we're supposed to expunge it. Um, so I just don't know. They have the name. <laughs> no, they cannot put their name in. They cannot. Well, the meaningful use criteria that's related to the family history is that you ask the family history on one relative. Pretty low bar.
Uh, yeah, that's interesting. So actually, um, we're, what we're going to be getting is actually how many um, how many relatives go to get the free screening. So we won't actually know if it's a physical letter or just word of mouth. But um, we haven't got to that part yet because we don't know if it's positive um, yet or not. But yeah, um, that's a good good point though. It's, because we weren't actually able, they they were very 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 concerned about the family members' privacy for the. Um, it actually took nine months to get it through the IRB. And so we actually aren't able to ask them anything about the book at all. All we're able to do is if they go to the lab, they can tell us that a kit was run based on this other person being positive. That's all that they're allowed to tell us. So they're not going to get a lot of information. Thank you. 